about in the Q and A. Um, there's a lot going on. I mean, there's a lot going on in DC. Um, I have never seen a presidential administration so hell bent on destroying our country. And whether or not that's starting with the economy, focusing on schools, what they're doing with their foreign policy, what they're doing with our border, um, what they're doing to our American businesses, it is frightening. This is the fight that we've got to take on right now. And we can start talking about the border. Um, I think that's in the front of everybody's mind. Is what's border. going on on the border. And I've got, I've, got, I've got some stats that I do want to go to here. Please do. Um, we have been talking about this for a number of years. And we have, uh, we got to go back to D.C. on Monday. Um, they're now calling us back the last week of February because last Friday we actually passed a continuing resolution. I did not support it, but it pushed it out until March 1st. Um, I think it is dangerous for us to continue to fund agencies that are hell-bent on destroying our country. And this right. is a hill that is worth dying on, making sure that we get whatever kind of funding mechanism passed that we've got a component in there that secures a border, period. And how much support is there for that? Like, is that just a pipe dream and we say these things, but we're not really gonna get that? Well, when we look at, and, and I'm just gonna be realistic, we don't have control of the Senate. We don't have control of the, of the presidency. And we have one heartbeat away from losing control of the House. One. But even with our speaker, does that mean that he will push for it and the speaker, fight for it. The, the speaker is pushing for it and fighting for it. He's also kind of sunk in, right? <laughs> no. Give no. it in. Mike, Mike Johnson's not getting oh, in at all. No. But Mike has as much power as he's got votes behind him. So if he does not have 100%, and it needs to be 100% of the Republicans behind him, he's got no power whatsoever in that room. But why is that? Why doesn't he have the power? Why doesn't he have that 100% behind him? Because it takes one Republican to say, I want more. It's not enough. And to, to threaten to vote against it. It takes one Republican to say, that's enough. And if we don't have enough Republican votes, I'll vote with a Democrat to make sure that we're getting it done. One vote. It just takes one vote. Now, Nancy Pelosi had five members. Did you just call her Nasty Pelosi? I did not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> she said, Pelosi. Pelosi had a fine member of the majority. And yet she was able to pull everybody in. Now, look, but we see the Democrats vote as one. Well. We see the Democrats. Okay. Now, I had a speech, and then we're going to do Q&A. But I wanted to go over my numbers, but we can we can keep interrupting. That's fine. Well, no, 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 I, no, no, I will no, no, no. interrupt. But, but you see Democrats what? We see Democrats when they don't have the majority, when they don't have um, the House or the Senate move forward with their agenda. And I, I, I've been there. I've been there for this is my third. This is my third year. My first two years, they had that, so they had the majority. So the last year, they have not had the majority in the House, but they have had it in the Senate and they have had the presidency. But I think the question that she's raising is. Yeah. When Nancy Pelosi was speaker, the Democrats voted as a block. Right. There was no one vote going right. this way right. unless it was planned. Right. And there were some places where they were. Yeah. The Republicans, on the other hand, can never go, never get a block together. There's right. always somebody that right. wants to go off somewhere. And I'm, Which I'm is, agreeing with you. Regardless of what, yeah. how long you've been there, that has been the case for I, I'm, a, for I'm agreeing with you. A yeah. long I'm, time. I'm agreeing with you. And because it takes one person. Which, which makes... Yeah. Me, as a grassroots uh, yeah. person, believe that it's purposeful, that there is a benefit to the Republicans to be able to sit there and come to our constituency and say, oh, we tried. Sorry, we're one vote away. There's constant, constant um, excuses all the time. Long before you were in office, um, going back for a very long time, and I think the population has had enough. We've had if enough. it's a conspiracy, I'm not in on it. I, I haven't shared it. I'm talking about it. If it's a conspiracy, I haven't seen it. 
what the I results, have seen, the results are there. So, so what I have seen on the floor, and I can just tell you what I've seen firsthand. What I have seen on the floor is you've had good freaking bills that have been solid, that you have a handful of Republicans who refuse to vote for because it doesn't go enough. So who are they beholden to? Because they're certainly not beholden to the American people. So they're selling us out. I would argue, down the road. I argue that these are our, our, our farthest right members. Oh, they're too far right? I'm not saying they're too far right. I'm just saying, you know, the ones you, could vote, you could argue that you voted against the Bible because it didn't mention Jesus in them. You've got people who will not vote for certain bills, period, regardless of how much you put into them. I can't tell you, I cannot explain why it happened, but I can tell you that I watched for two years, Nancy Pelosi be able to pull together a very, very small majority into a very strong workhorse getting bills passed that we somehow so as a Republican- So right that, that, that is the problem. No, you've got about- It's the grassroots that's the problem that are telling the, those representatives, don't vote against, don't vote for this garbage that you that you're packing our bills with. You come with 3,000 page bills that are full of pork. I haven't seen a 3,000 page bill yet. Or, okay. Well, I haven't about. seen a 2,000 page bill yet. Either. You come with bills that you vote on and you haven't read. Tell me you've read every single bill that you vote on. I've read the Private. highlights of every single bill I've read, I voted on. Mm. I, think, I think the but what's, so, so tell me, I mean, I mean, we can, we can complain and we can say, then, then why are we complaining? I'm looking at the results so that are coming out. Then, then, the nobody should, then, then, then no Republican should run. We should all give up. No. That's not what I'm saying. But if, all, we're I'm history, saying. if we're looking at history as being a forethought for what's going to happen in the future, and you're saying it's always been that way, tell me how to fight it. By not making excuses of why you can't and I have do things. Oh, she's not I don't think this is about you. No, no, no. Yeah. But when we talk about when we talk about with Republicans, we tend to act as if it's one person, right? Mm -hmm. Republicans. And I had a meeting. I had a meeting not that long ago with some of our Republican presidents, and they're like, "Well, Republicans need to do this. Republicans need to do that. Republicans need." I'm like, "Stop!" Like all of us in this room are Republicans. All of us in this room have like a mouthpiece, and we all have influence. So what are we all doing? Like, if you're just counting on the 218 that are in Congress right now, like, we've already failed the country. Like, all of us are part of, uh, part and parcel of making sure that we're moving this forward. So for the, the presidents of the Republican clubs, like, what are you doing to, on the outreach? Mm -hmm. What are you doing to come up with the platform and explaining it better? and making it that it is attractive for people to jump on and want to support it. Like all of us or even if have they don't responsibility. Want to, they have to be made to feel pain so that they, like, this is what our party believes in. This is what we want. I don't care what you want. You need to represent us and you need to vote as you said you would. So it's not an attack on you for sure, because no, we no, know no. you're doing, yeah. you know. I think if I might, then we can move back to the border. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the part of the problem is exactly what you said. It's gone on for so long yeah. that there is a group, even that far right group. You have to respect the fact that they're very conservative and they've never been listened to. Never. So now that there's a thin majority, they've got a little bit of power. So they're trying to push and say that we have to do more. There's another group. And you keep in mind, by the way, that, that far right is some of my best friends in Congress. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, like I said, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So I did. Like, I totally did. I agree with them. But yeah. as you pointed out, they're just disgusted, just like yeah. most of us are. They're disgusted that nothing's ever happened. And now that we have a thin majority, they have some power to maybe try to do something. Okay. Um, on the other hand, there's another group in there. Now I'm getting off into my personal opinion of the whatever you want to call it, uniparty, the people that like being in Washington and, no, oh, we got to have a little give and take and all of this, the, the Mitch McConnell types. Establishment. The establishment guys. So between the two, I think there's a group, which I would include you in, that are really trying to get some stuff done. And maybe we got to compromise a little bit here. And these guys are saying, look, we've compromised for years and got nothing. So we're not going to do it. The other side's going, well, wait a minute, we need to... And in the middle is maybe a big group, I would hope the biggest group, that's really trying to get something done, but we have a thin majority. And with those two groups pulling on the sides, 
it's going to be very difficult. Would you say that's accurate? Um, I think you've got 200 people that want to get stuff done, and you've got outliers. You've got people, and it takes all of them. And it so. takes all of them. And you've got folks who represent Biden districts. You know, look at the freshmen from New York. They represent districts that are not nearly as um, conservative as some of the other districts. You do. You're representing 700,000 people, and you're trying to figure out, okay, what is the desire of that of that district? It's going to be different. And while you may want one thing, you may want something else, you may prioritize something else. And if somebody votes some way on something, that's it. Like that's their your one issue. And, and the Republicans and, and, are the only ones that the problem the Republicans, their weakness, I guess if you want to call it that, is they have ethics and moral character. So when their people are looking on this, they kind of go, okay, well, I've got to kind of represent and we're the people. Yes, exactly. and we're independent. Like, don't tell me. Like, when I ran for leadership, one of the things that they asked me is, are you going to vote with leadership? Understand if you're in leadership, that's the expectation. I'm like, I don't give my vote away, period. Like, no. So I see, for is... example, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not voting for anything that's going to continue the Nancy Pelosi level of spending, that's not holding the agencies accountable, that's not prioritizing our, bo our border. I'm not voting for those things. And, and, and I would be in a you know, possible outlier, and I have. I mean, when you look at the CR split, it was almost 50-50. And by the way, I was there. They had to keep that vote open because part of our Republican rules were that in order for a, a rule to pass, it has to be supported by a majority of the majority. So you couldn't have more Republicans voting against it than voting for it if you wanted to pass. So, but when we see some of these fights going on, you know, different people have different motivations. Some people are looking at fundraising. Some people are looking at getting their name out, right? I mean, it, and this is on uh, this is on all sides. For some people, it's personal. The vote against Kevin McCarthy, you know, like Kevin McCarthy, hate Kevin McCarthy, don't really care about Kevin McCarthy. You could argue that for some people that was personal. Um, and for the very fact that the vehicle that they used to have the motion to, vocate, to, to vacate the speaker uh, has already had been repeated and yet hasn't happened to the next speaker. Um, people are, are, are people and representatives separate. But it would be much more efficient. It would be much more productive. And to your point, you know, it would be much. It would be much better for the country if we could come together as one voice. Yeah. Um, and what I have seen up there is, because it is such a narrow majority. On, um, to your point too, people think they've got a lot more power, and that power can be used for the good. And I would argue in how we constructed the Limit, Save, Grow Act. I was in those meetings. I mean. You've got you've got people again who are on the more moderate side of our of our party, who are representing much more moderate districts, and then you've got much more conservative districts. In that act, it was like if you added a dollar, you were going to lose these people, <laughs> and if you took away a dollar, you were going to lose these people. I mean, it was just like a balancing act, bringing that puppy to the floor. They were like all looking around, like I didn't think it went enough. And Scalise came up to me on the floor, and he's like, "I need you to vote for this." I'm like, "I want more cuts, and I need you to vote for this." And then you know, you had people like Michael Lawler from New York going, "I can't. This is going to cut too much. Like, you need to vote for it." So this was like wrangling everybody together, and we supported those numbers, and everybody is on the record supporting those numbers. And at my point was, look. When you send McCarthy or or Johnson, you know, I mean, interchangeable, and they're going to go when they're going to go negotiate with the president, and you know, with, with McConnell and Schumer, if you send in the Speaker of the House, and he is able to say, "I've got every single member of my party; they will not vote for this. This is what they're voting for, and this is our line." If they know that they have that going in, that's powerful. But they know they don't have that going. Do they walk around and try to get that? Try to get pants? Yeah. Oh, there's meetings after. It's a guy with a whip, I understand. I'm on, I'm on, <laughs> on the whip team. team. I'm, on the, I'm on the whip team, and half the time I don't vote for some of I want to. I want to. But no, these meetings go on and on and on. I mean, that 10-week period or however many weeks, it felt like it was a lifetime. 
that we were negotiating for that speaker vote mm. was fertile. Um, you saw all sorts of negative personality traits come. I mean, you just you, you did go personal. Um, in, in, in the behind the scenes was uglier than any sausage making I've ever seen. Mm. And it just kept going on and on and on. Um, but once you come together and you get a speaker, you move on. But the speaker is only as strong as the party behind him. And when you've got votes, like we we, we had before the CR vote um, that, that got uh, McCarthy vacated, there was a bill that was on the floor that was a temporary um, budget. It would have supported the, the government without shutting it down, but it was not a CR because a continuing resolution continues the level of spend. This included a 30% cut in discretionary funding, a 30% cut, largest we've ever had in our, in our country's history, largest we've ever had. And it also included provisions to force HR2 forward, which is the, with this, the Secure Border Act. Oh, okay. So that would have returned the remain in Mexico. It would have helped fund more of uh, Customs and Border Patrol agents to actually turn people away you know, and, and have them stay in, in Mexico during their asylum claims or the first state the country. It would have supported local law enforcement to be able, it would have forced the agency to do their job and apply the law. Mm -hmm. That was part of it. We had 21 members of our party that didn't vote for it. Uh, didn't vote at all? They did not vote for it. And what was their reason? And by the way, the folks that were supporting it and the folks that were negotiating it, the folks that came up with this bill, Chip Roy, Byron Dowling. Hardly the um, rhinos, right. the squishes. Right. These were like hardcore members that were coming up with this, and they got the the more liberal members on board. So what happened? Members. What ultimately killed it? Twenty-one members were but, yes. but what? Why? What was their excuse? It wasn't enough. So, so let's take what we can get and try to get more. Legs. So what we faced. So what we faced was the very next day we were forced to put. McCarthy was forced to put on a continuing resolution that passed because you had the Democrats that were for it. And you had Republicans who didn't want to shut down the government. I didn't vote for it. But that was that was the mechanism. That was the vehicle that they used to vacate McCarthy. And it was 21 Republicans voted with every single Democrat to force that down because it wasn't perfect. Right. And and, and this is what we're up against. Never heard of the 80-20. Are these Republicans we need to try to get rid of? No, or, I yeah. mean, they're, they're good ones that just didn't do, didn't get enough, and so they didn't vote. We have to vote together as a body. And when we don't, we cannot allow, you know, and, and it sounds like this sounds like, you know, an excuse, but you can't allow what good, what is it, perfect to be the enemy of good. Mm -hmm. And when you have a, a, a bill that cuts discretionary spending by 30%, that secures our border at a time that we had to have our border secure. When you're looking at the numbers, you're looking at 200, 300,000 people coming over illegally every month. The fentanyl poisonings that are happening as a result, the child trafficking, the sex trafficking, the human slavery, the cost that's that's being added on top of every single community that we're feeling. You know, the people who are getting pushed out of their schools because they're putting illegal immigrants in, people that can't get health care. I mean, all of that. That should have taken a priority. It wasn't good enough, so they didn't. So how do we get back to that? Like, I, I feel like all of us, whether we're working with city council or our counties or our state and obviously federal, there's always gonna be these factions within the Republican party. We are never gonna have this purity that we need to make things happen. So what happens next? Like with the border, what do we do? <laughs> So there's, and I, we can go over it. We can't go over the numbers we don't have. You guys probably know the numbers better than anybody. Um, you know, you've got 100,000 people who've died as a result of fentanyl poisoning. And by the way, that's months old. I guarantee you it's more than that now. 107,000 was the latest I heard, but that was that number is probably even older. And that's annual. Um, that's, that's annual. We've, we have five Texans a day who are dying from that. Five a day. Um, and where it's coming from is from from China. And we know that that's where it's coming from. It's being manufactured in, in, in Mexico. We've had 10 million illegal immigrants come into our country. Four million of those, by the way, have come through Texas. 
we, if you look at the getaways that they've had, which are pretty much gang and cartel members, 60% of them have been in Texas. We're taking on Brian, and we're having to pay for it. Last year, they spent $5 billion fighting it. We, we're eating through a rainy day fund because the federal government has not only not, you know, not allowing taxpayer-funded Homeland Security to do its job, but now they're also using taxpayer-funded dollars to fight the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. Texas had to put, what is it, $6.43 billion into its budget for next year to do this. It's, it, it's insane. I don't need that. They're going to go down there and cut the wire. They cut the wire, right? Yeah. Oh, wow. gosh. yeah. Yeah, I, I'm still trying to study that uh, Supreme Court case and understand what happened. We all are. We know Roberts, but Coney Barrett was. Yeah. That was. So but there's still there's they're going to appeal that or whatever the next step is. Well, right? you, you like from the Supreme Court? I don't you know, know, but that's what they said. They're going to fight it. Yeah. It. No, the it only thing is, is, it's only it, it was only to allow it until the court case that's yeah. actually. Oh, so oh, the this was this was the lower court court's order it's, until the case goes to the lower court. Until it comes up, but that just so means that now it's they're going to not a done it. deal. And Paxton those numbers said, aren't going to change for the next few months. So, so because of uh, Operation uh, Lone Star, right? Texas apprehended four hundred thousand illegal immigrants. Texas arrested more than thirty-three thousand criminals, and they had over thirty thousand felony charges. And Texas sees over 426 million lethal doses of fentanyl. Okay, that, that's what Texas has been able to do. And you've got an administration that's fighting them on it. Um, from day one, Biden's administration, Biden, was told what would happen if these policies, like the Remain in Mexico policy, like the Title 42 policy, like on um, the catch the, 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 the asylum claims, the, the first same country, what would happen? If those were disturbed, if those were removed, they knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And and you can argue that they didn't think it would happen. They could, you can argue that they think it was a humanitarian issue. <laughs> Isn't it, it what they want? Indictiveness? It's what they want. It, so it, it was because they wanted to get rid of anything that Trump had, right? It was an indictiveness. I think, on, honestly, this was planned. Yeah, so they hate issue. America. But that's that's what the conclusion I come to. They they are not destroyed. They don't love America like we do. They don't want to preserve it. They don't want to preserve our culture, our people. They're going to reimagine it. Yeah. So if you recreate the country if you the, look at the way they think it should be. Well, it's also creating what they no, said ten million more ten million voters. more voters. Mm -hmm. that they go listen to them. what the people are now I'm going off into. Oh, even crazy. <laughs> the great reset people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's if you just easy. listen to what they say. And Obama was a big supporter of that. And the fact that this is happening all over the Western democracies, not happening in Iran, it's not happening in the Middle East. You mean over. nobody's fighting to get into Iran and the Middle no. East? <laughs> but the flood yeah. is going yeah. into all of them. Like, people are complaining to leave our country. Yeah. The flood is going into all the Western democracies. And the Great Reset people know that they have to take the democracies down yeah. in order for their central control. So the reason, and it drives me nuts when these guys all go, well, why is Biden doing this? Biden's doing it because he buys into the Great Reset stuff, the globalist stuff. Do you really stuff. think it's Biden at this point? No, no. It's, it's Obama. Okay. But I call yeah. it the old Biden administration. So. But yeah. they buy into that, and that's what drives me nuts is nobody this administration seems is working to, with the cartels nobody seems exactly. to at the, at the republican leadership level yeah. acknowledge that it's almost like they're afraid well they're going to be called conspiracy now yeah. those guys said it they said what they wanted to do they have to have a homogenized population that has no ties to the country's values so they bring in people from other countries and like sweden now is getting oh my god there's nothing swedish left they're starting well, to look kick at them out. Look at Finland. Finland too. Finland is shut down their border. They they're had doing 60 it. illegal immigrants. But they're, fine. Nice they're, they're finally they're seeing exactly. their can't. culture is being changed because the population that comes in has no ties to their values and their culture. That's what they want. But nobody wants to acknowledge that except somebody like Dan Bongino, and they go, oh, he's nuts. It's conspiracy. But if our Republican leadership understood that, maybe they could plan a little differently. You're not going to get Biden to change any of this stuff. You're not going to get him to, even if you pass the laws, he's not going to follow. You don't follow the Supreme Court. 
Well, here's what I wonder. Wouldn't know that. Why don't our leadership, leadership but know you that. can Congress and Senate know that. You can't can force them. Know. You can't force them to do it if you tell it to funding. Mm. Let's, you, let's if you are that. not, if you are not going to enforce the laws, you don't get funded. And, 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 okay. you can, and you but can, and you can really, say yes. Are you going to really cut off all the funding for the border patrol? Yes. Cut off all the funding for HHS? Yes. Cut off all the funding for the FBI? No, they just gave the FBI a new building. Are they going to no, really? No, they haven't given to them. We're still fighting. Yeah. They, well, they're asking for it. They're asking for it. But my point it. is, it that's it's another one that goes back to the lay of that one of those battles that you know Republicans get beat up for. You're you don't want to fund. We have a border crisis. You don't want to fund the the border patrol. That's not what we're saying. No, the fourteen don't want to... trillion dollar, the fourteen trillion dollar supplemental that the president was asking for was not to secure the no, border. No, no, no. It was to more is higher agents to more and efficiently more let efficient people in and process process people in. Yeah. And then when you start looking at what's happening in the Senate bill that they're negotiating right now, because uh, we had Senator I'm Cruz, seeing. we had our, our Senator Cruz uh, at, at our at our delegation uh, luncheon last week. What they're trying to do is normalize the numbers that are coming through now. What they want to do is. Well, they're going to allow up to 5,000 people yeah. to come into our country illegally every and day. And then they'll do the math. Mm -hmm. 5,000 people every day is nearly 2 million a year. In well, I think if under I Obama, 1,000 a a people a day was considered yeah. a crisis. Yes. And now we're looking at five times that, and we're going to put that into, into writing that that's okay. Yeah. I, I mean, when I drive to my husband's hometown, it says population 5,000. I mean, that's an entire town every single day. Like, how, how do people not get that? And they, they do. do. And, they they point, get and then they're also trying to negotiate that they can have work visas. Well, if they're right here, let's allow them to work. That's you want to talk about bringing a vacuum in. It lowers all the wages. It, yeah, and what about all those uh, our lower income people who rely on those you know, hourly jobs that now they can't get them. Construction is almost all Hispanic. I mean, you can't get a construction And job. I'll try to tell you that um, Americans don't want those jobs, but I know Americans that want those jobs and can't get them because they don't fit into the right culture. It's my hope, though, and, and for people that I've talked to, that bill from the Senate would be dead on arrival. But again... But H2 is dead on arrival. Was Cruz just forewarning y'all? He's definitely not for it. Oh, no, he is not for it. He's, he is not for guy. Yeah, so no, tell no, me something no, he's not hopeful. Well, I know I did <laughs> want to talk about that. <laughs> 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 you know, I did, well, I did want to talk. I did want to talk about that. That what we're seeing in North Texas as, as a result of what's gone on the border, bringing home. Because one of the things that I do, and I don't know if it's just my experience. I know it's the experience of local elected officials. I don't stay in DC when I'm not voting. Like I come home. We do, anybody who wants to know, what the hell are you guys doing up there? Like, if you want to know what I'm doing, sign up for my weekly newsletter. It will tell you um, interviews that I've taken, uh, you know, interviews that I've given, work that I've done in my committees, bills that I'm introducing, bills that I'm co-sponsoring, how I voted, on um, floor speeches that I have made, tours that we're, that we're doing, people that we're meeting with. I mean, those are things I think are important that I'm doing. When I'm home, we're meeting with people and we're talking to them and we're saying, why is this important to you? And as your representative, how do you want me to fight it? You know, these policies are, are coming down. Let me know what you think of this. So we'll have law enforcement roundtables. I'll meet with our with our schools and, and, and members of our of, of um, our, our academies. I will meet with healthcare. You know, we have healthcare roundtables. I mean, small business roundtables, manufacturing. I mean, I try to do my best to make sure that I have my finger on the pulse of what this district needs. And when I sat down and I talked with our law enforcement and I asked them, what are you seeing here as a result of what's going on at the border? Bring it home to me so I can, I can, I can argue this. This is what we're seeing in North Texas. What, what they're telling me is that um, in 2023 alone, Tarrant County, uh, the sheriff's office made 115 human trafficking related arrests. Uh, they made outreach to nearly 100 potential known and suspected, and suspected victims that they identified. In one case, 10 victims were identified and the operation was tied back to Mexican cartels. When you look at the number of cartels that are doing, um, um, uh, that are in, engaged in crime in cities across the country, we've got more cartels that are doing um, uh, crime in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, North Texas, than anywhere else in the country. Oh, great. Wow. 
We got drug trafficking. So, <laughs> so we had more than 1,100 North Texans have died from fentanyl poisoning. And by the way, this is a couple of months old, so I guarantee you, again, it's more than that. Fentanyl-related deaths have increased by 33% since 2019. Now accounting for almost half of all drug-related deaths, again, killing an average of five Texans per day. Uh, in Carrollton Farmers Branch, fentanyl was laced into pills, and they were sold in middle and high schools. Wow. Middle schools and, and high schools. the guy that was doing it. Yeah. Nine students overdosed. Three students died. And 100,000 fentanyl-laced pills were sold by one drug dealer. Uh, Tarrant County Sheriff's Office saw a 1,000% increase in the amount of drugs seized in a short two-year span. Wow. In 2020, they seized $3 million worth of drugs. In 2022, you guys want to guess? Five million. Thirty-five million. Oh my gosh! So that's just that's in Tarrant. Tarrant and Tarrant County also it's witnessed a thousand percent way. increase in fentanyl poisonings over a four-year period. Um, and that so in uh, 2018 and 2019, ten victims of fentanyl poisonings. Now in 2020, 2021, it was 113. Um, when you talk to, I, I was down in Mexico City. I talked to President Obrador. He's like, this is an American parent problem. This is a parenting problem that you've got. Parents aren't involved. Their, their kids, they're, they're raising drug addicts. And so we're simply, you know, our poor farmers, working farmers here are simply responding to you know, a need that, that, that you and have. Not, this is not this is not our issue. This is America's issue. So, so they're they not it's working. It's the supply and demand issue. Right. It's not them. What do you think the problem is? What do you think the purpose of the problem, the driving factor of it is? Of fentanyl? Wow. Oh, I think right now that the cartels are making money hand over fist. I think that it has become from a cottage industry to a multi-billion dollar industry. Yeah. I think that Oberdor is happy to have the, the, those dollars pouring into his country. Because it's adding stability. China. Fentanyl's coming from China. That's the bigger thing. But the cartels are the ones who are making a ton of money. They're facilitating. They're, they're, they're being enriched by it. But why would China, just hypothetically, or why, why do you think China is flooding our market? Fentanyl. Why do what why problem? is China sending spy balloons? Why is China looking <laughs> at at um, um, their high frequency weapons? Why is China taunting us with Taiwan? Why is China taking our intellectual property? What, why is you China you know it, what, having what, unfair what, trade what, practices? Yeah. I mean, China China's is not our clear. friend. I agree. It's very clear and so, they're taking us out. They're China is not our friend. Out. I agree. And yeah. I and I asked that question. Yeah. Because I think we get so involved in the minutia and the, the grievance of what's going on yeah. that we're not seeing the bigger picture of why what's going on. We get all wrapped up in the what and forget about the why. I will, I will I, blow your mind. I will go one step further. I was, t I was talking to a, a, a journalist in D.C., and this was about a year ago, and she, she blew my mind. She said, you know, we sit here and we talk about Democrats and Republicans. And we say that the media is an arm of the Democrats, right? And she goes, think about it. Wouldn't it make more sense when you, th when you start talking to your Democrat colleagues and you see how fast they can flip right from an issue on one side to the other side? She goes, isn't it make more sense that the Democrats are actually an arm of the media? And then you start going back and follow the money. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good point. Who is paying for the media? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, would say, I would say even one step further than that. Yeah. Higher than that is that if you, if you're as I am. But 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 but, but answer the, but, but answer that question. Like who 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 is who is who owns the media? It's the multinational corporations. And then go a step back. Who's got a lot of, of funding into that? It's a lot of hostile nations, including China. Exactly. And then you start thinking about our president and how he's been compromised. And this is one of the things that we are uncovering now because you've got a Republican-led Congress that we are going into his dealings and Hunter Biden's dealings in China, even though you've got a president who has said publicly, we didn't take any money from China. Yeah, you have. Millions of dollars. There are 20 shell corporations number of numerous members of your family and it's come down to you and so china has openly said that they have a belt and road initiative yep. that they are and they're actively engaging in achieving that belt and road initiative we have the globalists and wef and and the who 
who also have an initiative of global governance. Those two are working together. I mean, we can say it's a conspiracy, but they openly talk about it, what their goals, which if you if you go a little bit higher up to the onto the why is all of this going on, it gives you a better, clearer picture of how our country is under attack on the two fronts. Um, all the drugs are coming in is exactly what Britain did to China when they when they flooded the Chinese market with heroin because it it made their populace um, susceptible or easier to conquer. And so that's exactly what's going on. But the policies, and, too, that are coming out of this administration that's weakening American companies. Because they're compromised. We have a compromise. Preference. It's weakening, we it's weakening our, ener our energy production. Absolutely. It, it is, it, it's, it's not only weakening the U.S., but it's weakening our allies that we were able to actually help with their energy supply. We're Which not able to do that anymore. And then you start adding on to it. It's not just we're not able to produce enough energy for ourselves, but now with the initiatives that are coming from this administration regarding energy policy, mm -hmm. right, where the green new energy, where oh, are those things coming from? They're, they're, they're forcing us to re rely on solar panels that are created in China, and then there's EV batteries, which where are the minerals, let's just say, for, for lack of argument, they're getting those from Africa. Who owns the mineral rights in Africa? Mm -hmm. China. Mm -hmm. Which is All what? of these policies that are coming out, it's fairly clear that this it's administration is compromised. So very clear. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the biggest frustration with yeah. the American people it's are right now country. is that we can see it, yes. and we don't have our representatives articulating that. Exactly. We are very frustrated are that we can see them? how compromised our own representatives, our own government is, and we can see the threat. We see the threat and are pretty powerless to do anything about it individually. We so need to I, be collective and in I get identifying is, what our threat is. And so when I hear that nobody in D.C. is, is doing or saying anything about it, I've, I've heard countless speeches on the floor about it. I've seen countless um, pieces of legislation. that have been, I've introduced legislation, you know, to prevent China from being able to, to buy our farmland. You know, we, we have, there's a number of pieces of legislation that we, we are talking about it in Congress. I think it's not like we're avoiding it or we're scared about it. That comes back down yeah. to, the, to the bigger picture she's bigger talking picture. about. These are, those are individual little battles, but nobody is standing up and saying, look, these people are literally trying to destroy our country. And, and say it's all to do that? In our whole Republican leadership. They all ought to be if on we, board. You know, a little bit of history. The value from, of the threat. A little bit of history sincerity. from Glenn Beck. You know, I used to listen to him all the time. And back in the 1930s, when the communists who were based in Austria had to get out because Hitler was going to kill them all, they came over here. But one of the things that, that they realized was the big uh, uprising had to happen. The big communist uprising in Europe had to happen. Why hadn't it happened? Because everybody was sending their their family was going to the United States and they're going, boy, we can, everything's great over here. We can start our own business. We can do this. They knew that they had to get rid of the Democrat and the capitalist system before they'd be able to take over. Then they have still, they're still doing that. The globalists are doing it for the same reason. China's doing it for the same. I personally believe China is just riding along with them that they're going to figure they're going to be the guy on top. And some of our <laughs> leadership are playing along with China, not Republican, but Biden and Obama, thinking that they're going to be able to get out on top. And I think the tire of sure I need them. But I think it's just that bigger picture that we are in serious trouble because we have some powerful forces in the world that want to literally destroy our system. And we don't hear enough of that. We hear all the individual little, you know, battles, the farmland thing, the fentanyl, this, that, the other thing. Nobody stands back and puts the big picture except people like They're all you know, Glenn Beck. You don't want to listen to him because you'll cry. Well, <laughs> but I, again, I, I, I have given interviews where I, I have tied the pieces together. And I have heard a number of floor speeches people who have tied. But what we are is lawmakers. And you can say a law that, okay, condemns, which we have, by the way, we condemn. 
CCP. We, 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 have a, 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 we, we condemn them. I mean, we did come out and do that, tying the pieces together, talking about it from an overview, not just farmland or your spy balloons. We did that this past year under Republican. We, 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 well, we're not, we just we're not, not, we're not, we're not out. holding the punches. But part of the problem with the message getting out is there's so many frigging messages to get out. Mm -hmm. Are we talking about energy? Are we talking about the border? Are we talking about fentanyl? Are we talking about what's happening in Israel? Are we talking about what's happening in, in Russia and in Ukraine? Are we talking about what's happening in Taiwan? Are we talking about what's happening with inflation? What's happening with interest rates? What's now, happening with our... our they're all related. Related. But they're that's not what your point. But, 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 but we're, all saying we're not talking about this. Yes, we are. But there are so many things that we're right. talking about. Because it, it feels like we are constantly in response mode to another crisis. Yeah. Right. But the thing is, back to the tying it all together, the only person that I've heard consistently year after year tie it all together is Donald Trump. And that's what the basis of America First is. The rest of the world is on our ass. They're after us. And we have to make America strong. We have to make America first. That's still. And, you know, now MAG is a dirty word and, you know, all that other stuff. But God forbid, yeah, make America great. I think say. that's the point. Yeah. He's the only one that ties it together to that one thing. They're trying to destroy America. Leave, All the rest of this stuff is, you know, the battles uh, are the individual skirmishes. This is the war. This is the war. They're trying to destroy America. But you fight wars by battles. True. And so what but you're you also have to, to have the bigger strategic picture too. And I would so argue you have to identify who the enemy is. And I would That's argue problem. that so when we're know. looking at these um, investigations that are going on, it's all tied to that. It's tied to that. Do you think yeah. there's any hope for justice in the Biden family corruption situation? We are having to do the job. So I'm on ways and means. And so Chairman Jason Smith. Chairman Jordan and Chairman Coma are having to do the job that the DOJ, IRS, yeah. and DOD haven't done. Yeah, and we're having to base. We're having to force them to do this. And this has been going on, by the way, for decades. I mean, with Hunter Biden, when we're looking at, um, they knew back in 2013 that these issues were brewing, and they allowed them to expire so that you can't hold them accountable now. So is there a light at the end of this tunnel, though, is my question. Is is there hope that something will be done, or will we just swing well, you've by the administration? We've got an impeachment, got an impeachment inquiry going on right now. I was involved in, um, last week, I was in the um, uh, deposition for Kevin Morris, the one who's paid off, you know, more than $5 million worth uh -huh. of, I, I was in that deposition. Um, I, I have been in um, executive meetings, ways and means, with the IRS whistleblowers where they talk very frankly, they are not able to do their job. They were told, no, stand down. Don't ask those questions. No, you can't go. They, they had, because it's, it's, it would be embarrassing to our, a, a high official. That's what they, I mean, you, you start looking at all that the That was testimony. actually in the documents. Yes, it's, it's not embarrassing enough. I know, right? <laughs> But, they got. but I mean, those those pieces of di those those emails, those conversations, all of this is coming out to light only because you have a Republican majority and only because we are going after after the information. We're not just saying we're going to impeach in, in, in that we are putting the information out there and we're having an investigation that should have happened by the agencies that were funding to do that and we're not. So now we're having to do the subpoenas. We're having to have but the, you, the. You all are following the justice as well. I mean, you're going through and getting all the evidence. That's not something that's been done properly mm -hmm. in any place or form. That's the other thing that Republicans are the rule of law mm -hmm. party. So we're doing it the right way. You're giving transparency to the U.S. people because mm -hmm. you guys are there representing us so we can see what the facts are yeah, so that you can part. go and you can make your case presented and then have action. But you can't just go and get it done without getting all of this in a row. And they have been completely negligent in ignoring it and burying it for how long. So you guys are doing your job. You're doing probably the job of four or five years in a matter of one or two while you guys are in the majority. I appreciate the you saying that. A lot you, of people you don't really are. And, and I would love to hear about our speaker 
because it's been a short period of time. Yeah. And remember, Nancy Pelosi had been there for years with her party. She probably had the dirt on everybody to be able to get them to vote with the law the way she wanted to go. But he's got to build his report with yeah, and his trust with people before he can get a lockstep in a Republicans to vote for things. So he's 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 getting his trust built up yeah. with everybody. I'd love to hear about him and what's going on with him and how it's working. So um, I did want to add one thing when you we were talking about the investigations and, and, and to your point, like is anything going to happen? Well, that you're you're seeing things already happen on all this information coming out, and I think. It's not enough to say, okay, well, you've got enough, you can impeach Biden. Part of the problem is what we've seen is the problem is so embedded in bureaucrats that can stay under the radar, that have no accountability. How deep does this go? And who within our bureaucracy is also compromised? So asking these questions and digging down and figuring out who said, don't go talk to them? Who's the one who made the call to tip off Biden that, hey, the FBI is on their way to go investigate this garage in my place? Who did that? And how? And have they done it before? Is there a pattern? Because if we don't uncover those people, you can change out the, the, the politicians, right? You can change them out. But the bureaucrats are there for forever. Yeah. And they are really, at the end of the day, so much more powerful than any of us give them credit for. We talk about term limits. Term limits are one thing, but at least you can, you can fire every two years a Congress member if they publicly go bad. The problem is, give bureaucrats term limits if you're talking about doing mm -hmm. it for the, for the politicians. Mm -hmm. Because the bureaucrats are the ones who stay there. I mean, when I was at HUD, like my first day there, I asked the question, like, I had a, a manager and a, and a director meeting. I'm like, how long have you been here? Right? You know, where, where are you from? What do you do? How long have you been there? The person had been there for like the least amount of time. Well, how long do you think? 17 years. Oh, oh my God. The person who had been there the longest. How long do you think? 30 40. years. 50? 52 years. Oh. I mean, I'm they know me as that's my whole life. They <laughs> have seen me. So, like, I really felt like a gnat in concrete trying to get anything done. And their job is probably not to allow anybody to get anything done. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, so part of this investigation, part of this is really sinking and finding out who yeah. within our bureaucracy that is not accountable to people, that you never know their name, they don't come out, who is really making those calls and to what end? Well, and that's smart because you're going in and you're getting those spiders that are all over that are doing nefarious things because yeah. you're not, if you just get one person put away, they'll still keep doing what they're doing to other people and start chaos. It doesn't matter. The politicians chaos is what they them. want. The politicians. Well, let me them. ask you about that then because yeah. everybody talks about how Trump had this great opportunity to clean house and get everything done right. And he failed. He didn't clean house. A lot of stuff didn't get done. And he takes a lot of heat for that. So maybe what you're saying is it's such a huge problem. He couldn't have. Like, how do you replace the entire bureaucracy? So, so a couple of things. One, the people that you um, that you appoint, right, are going to be there for two to four years. So even those appointments are so like, quick. And and by the time you get somebody in a position and they get briefed and they meet with an attorney and they, mm -hmm. by the time that they're effective and they actually have a plan, right, it's so brief to right. be able to do it. Mm -hmm. And then the bureaucrats who you are supposedly on um, um, managing have seen you come and go. Yeah. So they know exactly what they need to do to appease. And this is, I'm not saying all government workers are bad. I work with some really exceptionally strong government workers who really had their heart and soul into it. They were doing it for the right reasons, but I worked for some that didn't and been there a really, really, really long time. And they knew what they had to do to play the system. And you can't fire these people. We had people who weren't showing up for work. And we, we sit here and we have like our, 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 our reins act and get back to people back to, to work act. You know, that they say that people have to come back into the office. Before COVID, at HUD, people could work from home three days a week. There were people that I never met because they never came into the office. And were they, they accomplishing their job? Were they getting anything done? No. I can't get into the specifics, but I would argue, of course not. No. Of course not. 
How are you part of a team when you never come to the office? It, it, it made no sense and it could never happen in the private sector. So, so cleaning that out is important. But you got your, you know, the people who he had an opportunity to appoint is one thing. But then their ability to be able to get anything done, right. which is why I said I felt like a gnat in a vat of concrete. Because that my ability as a, as a political um, appointed position was so minimal. They've already figured it out. So until yeah. we can hold the agencies accountable, and until we can actually fire people who aren't doing their job and hire the best people for their job. Mm -hmm. We had openings. We had people who applied. You couldn't hire. You couldn't even in because you had to go through this step and you had to make sure this word was there. It had to be posted. Oh, the people who were already in positions, you got moved around because they got priority because otherwise it could take you a year to hire somebody. And when mm -hmm. you need something done, you know, you're okay, fine. Just give me that person. That's what happens. So never do it in the private sector. What do you have to do to get the bureaucrats to a position to be able to fire them if they're not doing their job? Uh, the, the federal employee unions need to go. Okay. okay. Federal Which, employee by the way, unions most people don't realize need that federal to go. employee and how do unions they go? are only there due to an executive order. There's no law that allows federal unions. Hmm. It's an executive order that and you, and you pay, and and you pay their salary. Overturn. You pay their salary. And, and, and as as managers of, of folks who are engaged in the um, unions, you can't ask what their time is spent. They're allowed to spend, you know, up or depending on whether or not they're like an elected official, you know, elected a member of, they can spend up to 50% of their time working on you. Up at, at home, we have offices for them, all have prayer funds, oh and all used to fight. It was, it was, it was literally a very difficult job because you, once you have a manager who tries to hold an employee accountable, they will get a grievance against them. Yep. The union will fight. And then once that happens, the manager is stuck doing paperwork, 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 and, and wasting their time on that as opposed to actually doing their job. And at the end of the day, they're like, I'm not going to do this again. So this person may only be giving me 50% of their time or 20% of their time, but it's just not worth the headache. Happened to a friend of mine, the Secretary of State. That's the very bureaucracy. But I'd like to, yeah. before we... Well, I also want to answer her question okay, about Mike Johnson, because you, yeah. you asked a good question. So, you well, know, that... Before we go to that, because we're going <laughs> to get off of this. Okay. I know. <laughs> we're going to get off of this, and I want to add kudos to you guys doing that, doing that work and digging down deep and finding those individuals and nobody, to answer your question, nobody's going to get convicted and sent to prison. Nobody's going to jail. Nobody's going to jail. No but but no what they're doing is they're, they're unearthing everything and putting it public and saying, here's what's going on. Yeah. Here, Here's the names. It's here's this. I've always work. wanted, every time you think, pick one, Oliver Stone, not Oliver Stone, Stone. Roger, Roger. Roger Stone, <laughs> not Oliver. <laughs> The guy, I want to know the FBI guy, his name that ordered a SWAT team to go get this 70 something year old guy at three in the morning. I want to know his name. I want it splashed all over. You may not be able to fire him, but you can splash his name everywhere. And that's what you guys are starting to do. The stuff with Hunter is coming out. Finally, it's bubbling up. It's showing on, on and we public. We're having to fight. Oh, yeah, they are because they, this is they've been hidden for for hundred years. They've been hidden, and you guys are pulling it out. You're not going to get anybody convicted of anything, but you're going to get it all in front of the people, and that's what we need. So kudos to you guys. You need to keep doing that. I'm hoping we're going to get some. Public Does that stop? If what? If the Democrats take the House, does all this investigation? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. Was, without a doubt. Look what's stops. coming out of the January so, 6th committee, the stuff that they didn't tell us. Look what's coming out with tapes. just some of the videos. Some of it. They haven't even released all of it. Just some of it. Have you heard the whole thing about the bomber? Nobody said a word about the bomber, but I've been listening to some stuff on the radio the last couple of days. There's one, one journalist that's been digging into it. And they started getting video that came not from Johnson. It came from a court case. And they put this video out so that it's bubbling up. This stuff has started to come to the surface, and that's a good thing for you guys to do. Aside from the law stuff, is bring all this crap up. Start putting names and places and dates out there because that's what the people need to see. And the next time the Democrats go and say, well, you know, these people, somebody's going to go, well, wait a minute, what about this? 
So Hopefully. good for you guys. So, Keep it up. We need that. So. We've got maybe five minutes to oh, finish geez. this up. So okay, I, want, well, I did want yeah, to. Okay, I want to make sure you get everything in that you want to get in. I so, got a bunch yeah. of stuff. So okay. now I, I I got through the first page. Of a lot oh, of so, <laughs> on Mike Johnson. Oh. Awesome guy. Love Mike Johnson. On strong, quiet. Mike got thrown into this job. Kevin had years of being able to prepare getting staff put in positions, getting a network of people, being able to work on fundraising to help bring in, to get a, a majority. Mike got thrown into this and he has done an exceptionally good job. He is taken seriously by his colleagues. He is trusted. He has a very strong reputation and he wants to do it for the right reasons. And he is spending an inordinate amount of time meeting with anybody who wants to talk to him and pulling together groups. He's doing his absolute best with a dumpster fire right now mm -hmm. because he is being shown very little respect from the administration or from the Senate. And part of that is because we are walking him in, not all one behind him. And I'm telling you right now, if we can start having some of these votes where we're not yeah. getting perfect, but we're getting really, really good and a lot better than we will if we have a few stranded, you know, uh, people who leave us stranded. That would make him a much stronger leader, but he's fighting to get that right now. How can we help? Other than calling our representatives and say, get on board. Well, I am not just being a harasser. I don't just call them. I don't just call them. I don't just call them. Yeah, mine do their job. Okay, but I'm going to ask. I do want to say, though, you know, yeah, when you talk about whatever Republicans done. No more conversation. Let's just let you. So what have Republicans done, right? Like, Because I heard this, and one of my dear friends, like, we haven't done anything. I would disagree. First, we got Congress and voted to defund Biden's army of new IRS agents. We created a new subcommittee led by Jim Jordan that's fighting back against the weaponization of the federal government. We ended proxy voting in Congress that your federal representatives actually have to show up for work now. They have to go to D.C. and go to, to their to their hearings. Um, we have passed our H.R. 2, or you have the Secure the Border Act, uh, HALT, the HALT Fentanyl Act last May. Um, we passed the Schools Not Shelters Act, which prohibits schools from being able to be used to house illegal immigrants and uh, reiterates that students should come first. We passed our HR 1 bill, which is the lower energy costs. I mean, that, that would increase domestic energy production, reform the permitting process for all industries, um, and reverse anti energy policy advanced by the Biden administration, streamline energy infrastructure and exports, boost the production and processing. Now, none of these have been enacted by the Senate, but we have one house. I mean, we can do what we can do. We should not be looking at it, well, what will the Senate pass and that's what you should pass. No, we as a Republican-led House need to pass right. out the most conservative bills that we can and then we need to hold the line so that we know we're going to fight with the Senate and we don't back off. But we also passed the Strategic Production Response Act, um, which is about emergency oil and having it not be able to, to continue to suck down our emergency reserves. Um, we passed him in a, a measure to block but his woke, uh, you know, ESG agenda. Um, the Reserving Choice and Vehicles uh, Purchase Act on oversight and accountability. This is long overdue, but we voted our first month to end the COVID-19 pandemic, the authoritarian lockdowns, the unconstitutional vaccine mandates. Um, we voted for legislation to uncover the truth about the origin of COVID-19, to hold China responsible, look at what's actually happening with the Wuhan lab, and any funding that it got through U.S. taxpayer dollars. We voted last month, March, to protect free speech from government censorship, to fight back against the FBI's attempts to use taxpayer dollars to censor free speech on social media. We are Parents' Rights Act that we were able to pass, um, which gave protection for women in sports. Um, we passed the parents' rights that, to ensure parents, not the government and, or teacher union, were in the driver's seat. It, it, it has, parents have the right to know what the children are being taught. They have a right to be heard. They have a right to see the school budgets. They have a right to protect their child's privacy. And they have a right to keep their children safe. Um, you know, we, we did have that, uh, that the resolution that's, that was rebuking and condemning the CCP's violation of our sovereignty. We, did, we were able to do that. Our spending and inflation bills, the range, which I, I think I talked about a little bit, that talks about holding the, the bureaucrats responsible and the agencies responsible. Um, in the first year alone, um, Biden, Biden's regulations added $200 billion in new regulatory costs. That was more than quadruple the costs during in, uh, Obama's first year. Two, the, his second year, it was a trillion dollars in new, in new regulations. So 
we basically brought that back into Congress and said that is not an executive order, that that has to be a congressional act of, of how the, these, these dollars are used. Um, that in every single major rule that was proposed by federal agencies <laughs> had to go to the House and the, and the Senate. And they also, the, the RAIN Inflation Act, you have to publish what the inflationary impact would be of all the executive orders to force that to be more transparent. And then we did the Limited Grow Act, which I already talked about. Um, these were things that we have done already, but the investigations, the looking at the impeachment, forcing this stuff to come out would never have happened without a Republican majority. Um, but you also have to look at the things that we have prevented from coming, okay? If we did not have a Republican majority, it's not just what we can pass out of the House, but it's what we prevent from passing, right? We prevent these things from ever hitting the floor. You look at the Inflation Reductionary Act, which was anything but. You look at the trillions of dollars that they spent. You look at the Green New Deal thing that they were able to pass through the transportation bill. All of those things have been prevented from coming forward on the floor because you've got a Republican majority. I would say that is getting things done. We can't control the Senate right now. We don't control the presidency. But we are busting out very strong legislation from the House. We all have to stay together and make sure that we're not losing it. Now, look, we've got a few months to all come together to be able to fight to make sure that, that Trump becomes president. That is going to be a fight in getting us all on the same page. The outliers, look, in, in, in DeSantis, God love him, you know, endorsing Trump, getting on, getting on it. You, you've got all these other people who are coming out with endorsements. I, I believe Nikki will probably stay in there until after, you know, South Carolina. Um, and then I, she, she shouldn't throw her, her weight behind Trump. But we've got a very few short months to all get on the same page. And it will be imperative that folks who don't like his tweets, that don't like his attitude, that think he's, you know, brash, fine. I, I, I'm not going to argue, I'm not going to defend that. But the policies that he put into place were effective. The, the, the justices that he put on benches, not just on the Supreme Court, but across the country, amazing. And to me, the strongest, the strongest um, tool that he brings to the table, not just his backbone, but the, the, the lessons that he learned during his first administration. I was just going to say. And the people that he, the team that he brought together during his first administration have stayed through AFPI mm -hmm. as a team. They have been able to more thoroughly vet and create a strategy moving forward. After do, things. Yeah. To do what you were saying. He did all that stuff with literally one hand tied behind him. Yes. Fighting uh, yeah. our own party for the first two years. Yeah. So you think about what was on the agenda had he gotten another four years. Thinking about the opportunities for that to happen again. All of us. All of us need to take responsibility for making sure we get people to the polls, making sure we bring together a, a solid argument about why Republicans need to maintain and grow. And we can fight amongst each other, we can shoot ourselves in the foot, and then we can be shocked when we don't get what we need. But there's too much on the line right now. If we have another four years of what we've already seen, and let me just put it into, in, 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 in just just on the, on the debt alone, not not the ten million illegals we've already come through, not 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 the number of deaths, what we've already lost in China. But if we just look at our debt alone, four hundred seventy-five billion dollars we've spent on on serving our debt in twenty twenty-three. They're looking at uh, one point four trillion being spent uh, in twenty thirty-two. Um, having think about think about how how large we have thirty-four trillion dollar debt now, over one hundred and twenty is what they're expecting in the next decade. We're not going to be able to service it. 50 cents of every dollar that we bring in is going to be spent on interest. It's going to grow faster than that. We have to rein in that spending. And the only way to do that is prevent these bills from coming to the floor. Mm -hmm. And when we do have an opportunity, like we're hoping to be able to have, cutting that back. I mean, the limit save grow prevented the, the, the normalization of the spend during COVID. You know, it, it went back to pre-pandemic spending levels, except for in defense. We have to get there again. But if we don't all start working together as a team, we just, it's a, it's a circular fire. And there's too much at stake.
that's what we were talking about. There, there are forces that want to fundamentally change the United States since fundamentally. Last thoughts? I think just her. <laughs> just want to make sure because at 11 pages I see them. I know. I mean, the Trump election. You know, it's it's it's, it's this is going to be a brutal election. Yeah, it is going to be a brutal election, and we have to get behind. And, and again, you know, I, I'm not asking anybody to defend, you know, on principles that they don't believe in. But certainly, we could all work and agree that we want to have limited government, that we want to have individual rights, that we want to have a secure, sovereign border. border. That we do want, you know, America's priorities to come first when we're looking at foreign policy. This, these are things that we should not back down and be embarrassed about. And there should be sensitive topics. Um, you know, I know this is closing argument, you know, closing, you know, closing <laughs> thoughts, and you know, I don't want to answer, but, but things like abortion, we should be able to talk about and not shy away from. Yeah. Because every issue we don't talk about, we leave a vacuum that Democrats can help oh, define us. Yes. And, and we make a mistake when we do that. But we also have to recognize that we are not the enemy, that there are enemy forces out there that do want to destroy our country, that 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 are, are all more than happy to watch us destroy our, each other. And we've got to get over that. So I appreciate you. Well said. I mean, it's a lot for us all to take in. I think we're all on the same page.